thank you for coming here today to experience an expo with us. It's great to see so many people here gathered around here. Um, I'd like to introduce one of our most uh, distinguished alumni, uh, Bob Wagstaff. Bob earned his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering here at the University of Idaho in 1986. And then he got another degree in metallurgical engineering the following year in 87. He's devoted the past 25 years to metallurgy and the process of making aluminum. He began as an intern. So those of you students looking for internships, uh, that's where it all begins. So he started as an intern. He later became president of Wagstaff Incorporated, uh, and he, where he traveled around the, the globe building connections with aluminum plants processing experts for Novellus. Not many people have heard of Novellus, but it just so happens Novellus is the world's leader in rolled aluminum products. The largest company in the world that does such. Uh, they make beverage cans, automobile, architectural products, consumer electronics. So the material that goes in, into your beer can and the material that goes into your iPhone. Uh, all all uh, produced by Novellus. Bob has invented several leading edge uh, processes for aluminum processing. And he's improved their efficiency and the energy consumption. Uh, one only needs to look briefly at the patent literature and learn about key technologies in use today all around the globe. Most of them have Bob's fingerprints all over them. <coughs> he's well known for his notebook that he carries. He's an avid note taker. He's often found pulling out a notebook to help himself to an impromptu teaching moment. Well, I guess we have one of those here. So, uh, Bob, where did you go? Where? Pull it up. I'm, I'm, can you hear me okay? In the back, is it okay? I'm kind of a transient guy, so I like to wander around a little bit. And, uh, but it's a good thing. It's, it's really nice to be back here. I, uh, yeah, I guess 25 years ago. Moscow's changed a lot, but taco time is still here. <laughs> um, dang it, that place is the same. And uh, they've got some new chairs. I was noticing in some new tables, new skins on the table anyway. But um, a lot of things about Moscow are the same. And it feels good to be back. It feels really good to be back. Um, so I have kind of a prepared talk, but it's over on the rostrum. So we're just going to get down to this thing. Um, in order to come here today and be paid by the corporation that I work for, Okay. In order to be paid to come here, I have to give a couple of slides about the company that I support and that I work for. All right? Um, so I work for Novellus. Um, we, were a, uh, we were a $6 billion startup company in 2006. Uh, we were part of the Alcan, Aluminum Company of Canada group, prior to that. Um, at that point, we became large enough that the Department of Justice decided they needed to change some things. Principally, they needed to change them because of some technology that, that my group invented. They could see Novellus taking complete dominance in the marketplace, and so they spun us. And, and so that's, why, that's how you end up with a six, seven billion dollar startup company. Um, and we are all about um, rolled aluminum sheet. It's kind of how we stack up. Um, we have 14% of the market share. Um, that's the largest. Alcoa, who are our good friends and competitors, um, they're just about 10. All right? um, and these are the, basically the top 10 producers that, that, we, that we compare ourselves with. Um, interestingly enough, the company that we were spun off from, Alcan, no longer exists. Um, the, those assets were sold via a leveraged buyout. And now that's, this is the company that we, were, we used to be um, a part of. 
Um, we, we make aluminum sheet uh, beverage cans, as, uh, as Dean Stauffer said. Um, rolled aluminum sheet for, uh, for automobiles. Um, so I'll just help you with some demographics or some statistics. If you, if you got up this morning, as I did, and had a can of Diet Pepsi, right? It was a trait from the University of Idaho. Um, the odds are greater than 90% chance that the last time that that aluminum beverage can was made, it went through the process that we invented. Um, if by chance you have a car that's made in Europe, e.g. a Mercedes, a BMW, a Range Rover, a Jag, not in Moscow, I'm sure, but if you have one of those cars, the probability is greater than 95% that it Last time it was, it was produced, it went through our mills. And it's 100% that the, that the last time it was solidified, it went through the process that we invented. Um, that's kind of who we are. Uh, we are metallurgical engineers. We have a lot of mechanical engineers. We have a few materials. Uh, we even have some sick, twisted um, electrical engineers. But we don't admit that. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, we are all about recycling. Um, in the world today, there is, there's roughly 19 million tons of aluminum sheet that's produced every year. Uh, we produce 14% um, of that. And of, the, of that material that we make, greater than 50% of our incoming stock is all recycled material. So we have plants around the world that just bring in your used beverage cans. They bring in extrusions. We bring in all kinds of aluminum scrap and we recycle it. And the reason we do that is because of the CO2 issue, the greenhouse gas, and because it's a heck of a lot cheaper and it's better in the long run. We made a strategic decision three years ago to target 80% recycle content in all of our products. Right now, we started at that point at just 20%. We're just at 40% as of Wednesday morning meeting. All right, that's good. For the, for the world, that's a good choice. For us, it's all about metallurgy. All right, it's all about mechanical engineering. And we'll talk a little bit more about how all this mixes together. But it's a good time. We just started up the world's largest ro um, recycle plant in Korea. Um, they have a capacity, not, not that you would recognize the numbers, of about 250,000 tons. In North America, we have four plants that recycle, and we, we produce about 600,000 tons in those plants. But Korea is the largest, largest single recycler, and we're building a 450,000 ton per annum recycle plant in Germany outside of Hanover. And those are the kind of projects that we have. We will invest this next year almost $1.2 billion in recycling alone, whether it's a collection scheme or it's turning it, transforming it into something of value. That's what we're about. It's all about recycling for Novellus. I chose this talk, uh, excuse me, I chose this topic today because I, I wouldn't say that I really like The Wizard of Oz, all right? When I see the movie, I think of, you know, the politics that was going on, the, 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 do we stay on a silver or on a gold basis? That was big, big political discussions at that time in the early 1900s. That's what I think. But... I chose this topic because at the time that I was working on it, I got an email from one of my new engineers that we'll talk about in just a second, and he, he put it pretty hard to me, all right? So it's about that quote, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto, which is actually, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Oops. The story goes like this. I hired from the University of Idaho an engineer. Um, I don't know if any of you know him. He's kind of a quiet kid. Um, his name was Patrick McHale. 
um, material science guy. Uh, I got a phone call one, and, and this is how the interview process works for Novellus. I got a phone call one Saturday, one Friday afternoon, from the guy that built my house, and he said, "Hey, Bob, there's a kid that worked for me a couple summers ago. He's graduating from the University of Idaho. He's a hardworking kid. He's in materials, and he needs a job. Do you have any opportunities? Could you just give him a, an interview?" And I said, "Heck, I'll give him an interview. I don't have permission to hire him." But I'll give him an interview. So I called the kid up. Um, he was on his way to graduation practice. Couldn't talk to me at that point. Um, I, so I, I scheduled, I said to him, Patrick, come see me on Monday. So he said, what time? I said, we start at 8. Or excuse me, we start at 7. He was at my office at 6.30. And he drove up from Moscow. All right? From an interviewer point of view, that's a raise the eyebrow moment. Right. Um, it was a good time. We spent nine months in training young engineer McHale, and um, at that point, he had done so well, he earned an opportunity, if you call it an opportunity, to go to the, uh, one of our new rolling mills that we're building in India and start up a key part of the process. So, come on, an engineer, nine months into the game. Um, he, ho he hopped on an airplane, he'd never had a passport before, never been out of the country, hopped on an airplane to Seattle, to Tokyo. Now, my guys are all required to give me a daily update. His text message was, we're not in Harrison, Idaho anymore, Toto, okay? <laughs> I mean, come on, Tokyo, all right? Gave it a little bit of a breath there, on his way to Delhi. Not New Delhi, but Delhi, as the Indians like to refer to it. He was there for four or five hours, and then he hopped a three-hour flight to a little metropolis of 1.2 million people um, called Bhubaneswar. Um, there's one hotel there. It's kind of interesting, uh, but it's a good time. And then he took the seven-hour drive to Sambalapur um, to where we, 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 we have our base. Patrick spent, he was supposed to spend three weeks there. At, the, at uh, two weeks into it, he called me and he said, could I stay? Sure, it's India, help yourself. <laughs> he, stayed, <laughs> he stayed six weeks, all right? I, I followed him about a week after he left. I can't tell you the, the accolades that the plant gave of this young man. He's passionate, energetic, he loves what he does. Engineers, and I'm speaking to you that's what makes the difference, okay? Even if you're an electrical engineer, <laughs> uh, that's what makes the difference, is that passion. And I, I saw a lot of it today, and I felt a lot of it, and it, it, it made me proud to think about University of Idaho with that kind of passion. I, I just love that slide, isn't that classic? <laughs> and I didn't have to violate any copyright issues to put it on here. Um, so Patrick took a journey. He started a journey just as Dorothy started her journey. Now, if you know the movie or you know the story, remember, Dorothy was basically beamed out in a Star Trek sort of way to Oz, the land of Oz, just as Patrick was beamed out of the University of Idaho, the place of comfort beamed into a foreign area. In the very beginning of the story, remember, Dorothy has some hesitations. There's some tears that are shed, some fear. Eventually, she meets some people along the way that help her, that help her make the journey worth the time. And engineers, now point number two, it's about the journey not about the finish line. It's about the journey. And today we're going to talk a little bit about my journey, because I'm hoping that you can learn a few, a learn from a few of the mistakes that I made. So I graduated from high school. I went to Central Valley High School in Spokane, Washington. Um, I came to the University of Idaho for a year. I don't want to tell about my grades because it wasn't very good the first year. Um, I was thankful they let me back. 
After my first year, I went on a mission. I'm a, I am a member of the, uh, of the LDS Church, and I went on a mission to Kobe, Japan. I learned to speak Japanese, which was pretty foreign, all right? And you'll see strains of that throughout my life. I came back from that. I went to the University of Idaho. I continued my education, and then I graduated, uh, first in mechanical, and then in metallurgical engineering. My choice was, was my choice. I chose mechanical because I like to build things, but materials always, it's always something about aluminum, all right? And, and I can't tell you, um, the first time I saw it, liquid, it, it was it's like I was sucked into a black hole because it was, oh, that's really cool. And, and that still remains in my heart. That's the passion that I talk about. Um, I, uh, I accepted a job after graduation in sales. Um, and they gave me, let's see, I had South America as my territory. I had the Middle East. I had Africa. I had the former, so well, what we know now is the former Soviet Union um, in India. Uh, it was the hot spot. Remember, in those days, back in 1987, the, the former Soviet Union was still the Soviet Union. Apartheid was a big deal in Africa that divided that continent. India was a closed society. Egypt... Um, Egypt had just shaken off the, the Russian support and the Russian structure that they had. Iran and Iraq were still at war. Beirut hadn't been blown up yet, um, and Israel was a mess. So as I went on my sales trips, I had two passports, one that I would show in the good places and one for the other places. Um, to this day, I, I, I don't... And even in that passport, I don't have a pass. I don't have a stamp from Israel, and I certainly don't have one from South Africa, because they weren't allowed. I had to turn the red one back. Right? I was glad to give that one back. I did that for two and a half, three years. Oh. And I decided to become um, a technical service engineer. I got tired of. I got tired of sales. All right. In the sales role, I learned about international finance. I learned about international banking. I learned about in-code terms. And I learned about barter swap because I couldn't get money in and out of these countries. And so one time, we actually did a transaction with tennis shoes. All right? One of the other transactions that we did was aluminum. And I, if I would have known now what I knew, well, if I, ugh. the guy that helped us with the transaction was later prisoned for some shady deals, <laughs> but um, it was a great learning experience for me. It's a great learning experience for me, but for some reason, I, I felt a pull back to the engineering side. Now, you need to understand that like many of you, when I finished, I don't know what you call it now, when I finished engineering science 320 fluids, okay, uh, with Woodney Amasu, as a graduate student, okay, I can't tell you how happy I was to sell the Robertson Crow book back for a buck and a half, okay? And I sold that one, I sold heat transfer, I sold thermodynamics, and a lot of other books. Because I didn't think I'd use them. When I became a technical service engineer, one of the, guess which area of the world they gave me? Africa, Middle East, Iran, Iraq. Yeah, I had the same place. And my, one of my very first sales calls that I make was to Egypt. And, and I was there, or excuse me, technical service calls. I was there for three days. What I didn't realize was that they were very upset, okay? Now, we hadn't serviced them very well, or there was another supplier that hadn't serviced them very well. So when I checked in to this building, they took my passport. And there was, no, there was no telephones in that area. And they kept my passport for six weeks. No communication home. 
wife, two sons. Um, I remember finally um, I, got, I got the process working well enough that they let me call home. It was about week five. And, and it was a deal where this was out in the desert up near the Aswan Dam. And there was a room that you went into and there was a, a you know, you had a telephone in front of you there. It was one of those black Bakelite ones. There was no numbers on it. Um, I should have realized when that was going on. Um, I gave them the phone number. They dialed it a few minutes later. You can pick up the phone now. And I picked up the phone. This is Cairo. What would you like to call? It was routed to Germany, eventually to Spokane, Washington, via the radio to a landline under the water to Spokane, Washington. Okay, so remember the phone that I described, right? Can't tell you how I felt when I picked it up, when they finally picked up the call in Spokane at the home office. And the response was, hello, this is Wagstaff Incorporated. I'm sorry, we're not at our desk right now. <laughs> I'm out for a break. If you'd like to speak to customer service, press 1. If you'd like to speak to sales, press 2. <laughs> what the heck am I supposed to do with that? All right? Anyway, I was pretty happy to get out of Egypt. But what I learned has remained with me for my life. Even though you have the money in your pocket, if the customer's not happy, your job's not done. So, for me and my business choices, when you seek to do business with someone, you better be prepared to make them happy. Because irrespective of what the money is, it's all about the smile. All right? After my Egypt experience, I had the opportunity to go to Japan. Now, remember, I spoke... Uh, I spoke Japanese. Um, I thought I did. Very religious Japanese. I got an opportunity to go to Japan and start up the largest billet casting. So we'll talk about what a billet is in a little bit. But largest billet casting system in the world. It was 107 billets. Um, 108, I guess. And it was amazing. It was not easy, but it was a good time. But they were the Japanese. And I learned at that point my lesson number two in customer service. The Japanese people are very determined. They are very detailed. And they want the best. And they wanted the best from me. And that was a key point for me in my career. Because based on what I saw in Japan and based on the feedback they gave me, I learned very quickly that the product that we were selling was not appropriate. It was a good product, but it was not great. All right? They had problems. I recognized it. Um, and that was a turning point for me. Whoops. Oops. Yep, that's the one. So I came home from Japan, and I had a long list of things that needed to be worked on. And one of them involved oxides and molten aluminum. And I had a friend that worked at Alcoa. And one day when I was in his office, I asked him, John, um, in a downspout, okay, it's, it, call it um, flow in a conduit, all right? In a downspout, how do you know if the conditions are laminar or turbulent? Well, that's a pretty embarrassing question, right? I mean, for you guys? Of course, he smiled, looked at me, and said, well, he went up to his blackboard. They were blackboards in those days. And he, he put the Reynolds number on the wall. Can you, I was kind of embarrassed. I'm, I'm glad Woodney's not here, OK? <laughs> but the, I was asking, is he around? Because you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to embarrass him. Um, he put it there. Hmm. And I suddenly learned that all that stuff that we had learned at school at the University of Idaho, there was an applied use for it. <laughs> okay, and even though I hadn't used it in the first three years of my career, and even though I'd gotten rid of all my books, there was a reason that we did this. All right? And that was a key point for me in my life. And so I started traveling back to the University of Idaho 
I, I would search in the library because that's, that's where I hung out and met my wife. Um, I would search out in the basement, search out in the third floor of the library, and I dropped by the bookstore and I bought all my books back at an inflated price, but you know, the market was clear. Um, you know how the bookstore is. Um, I bought them all back. Some of them were the same versions. Some of them were new versions. And some of them I couldn't get anymore. They were out of print, and I had to wait a few years to find them in the rare book section. Now, why in the world heat transfer would ever be in a rare book section, I'll never understand. But I'm here to tell you, I bought Frank, Frank Inquipera's book in the rare book section. And I'm glad I could find it there. It was $50, cheaper than what I bought it, but you know, whatever, 50 bucks. And I started working through my problem sets. I got my old files out, I got my old test files out, and I started working through my books one by one. All right? Heat transfer was easy for me. Fluid dynamics was easy. Thermo? It wasn't easy the second time, and it wasn't the first time. But I learned from it, and I went back through all those books over the next three years. And as I traveled the world, I took my books with me, and I redid my problem sets. And I relearned everything that I tried to pick up at the University of Idaho, but that I, maybe I just didn't see the value in it at the time. I became known as the guy that likes to read. And so the very same man that showed me the Reynolds number, or reintroduced it to me, gave me another book. It was titled, The Immortal Woodshed. And he said, you're a young man. I think you might like to read this book. You might like to learn where we came from. And he worked for Alcoa. So I took the book and read it. 160 pages, a couple hours on a Saturday afternoon. Okay, it was in an evening. Um, about page 30, you get to the point you cannot set the book down. All right? It's that interesting. I, I brought the book. Um, I teach a class at Novellus. When they appear in the, in the rare books in the world, I buy them, and I give them away to engineers who have that innovative spirit and the innovative drive inside Novellus. And I ask a couple of engineers, come on up to the front, to read a couple of paragraphs out of it for you so you could understand what it means to innovate. All right? OK, you're, oh, that's right, you're going to need this. So before I hand the mic over, understand, this is, this is the story of Charles Martin Hall. Anybody know who Charles Martin Hall is? Raise it. My wife does. Yeah. Thanks, hon. Okay, Charles Martin Hall is the man that invented the modern process to, to reduce aluminum or aluminum. All right? He is the founder of Alcoa. He is the founder of all of the world aluminum smelting business minus the French, who Paul Heralt did that one. But the processes are almost identical, OK? Twenty-five years after I read this book, I still get a little choked up when I read this, because Charles Martin Hall was 23 years old. If you're between 20 and 24 years old, raise your hand. Good. So you know what it feels. You know what this is going to feel like. Okay, guys. Page 56, and then continue. The first substance Paul tried as a possible solvent for aluminum was calcium chloride, the common mineral chloros bar. He did not know, however, that this mineral must be heated to over 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit before it melts. The melting point of fluorospar was beyond the reach of, of his furnace, no matter how hard he pushed the flame or how carefully he covered the crucible. For his next experiment, he decided to try some magnesium fluoride. This compound he had to make, and Professor Jewett let him work in the laboratory using their dishes, oven, and other equipment to react magnesia with 
hydrofluoric acid and dry the product. This mineral was also a disappointment. It wouldn't melt. Each day for several days, he repeated the experiment, but still got no aluminum he could collect or handle. And thinking it over, he said to himself, the cryolite must be dissolving silica from the clay crucible, and the electric current is using its strength in separating silica. Now, if I only had a carbon crucible, this wouldn't happen. So he made himself a small carbon crucible about two inches wide inside and four inches deep, and enclosed it in a tightly fitting clay crucible. By Tuesday, February 23rd, everything was ready for this next test. Julia had followed all these preparations with great interest and was on hand to watch when Charles melted the cryolite and alumina in his carbon crucible and connected the electrodes to his battery. As before, the bubbles of gas rising around the carbon anode showed that the electric current was at work. The current was kept on for a long time to produce as much aluminum as possible. Finally, Charles and Julia could contain their curiosity no longer. Charles poured the red hot liquid into the old skillet and let it cool. As soon as it was cool enough to handle, Charles seized a hammer and broke up the frozen cryolite. Almost at once, he spied among the pieces of cryolite a small silver button. I've got it, I've got it, he cried. Julie was so excited, she took the hammer and, after a few more whacks, found another silvery button among the broken bits of cryolite. Oh, Charlie, she examined, it is a little. <coughs> Here's my point. That very same passion that Charles Martin Hall had at age 24 was exhibited here today. I saw some pretty passionate people about pretty interesting stuff. All right? That's cool. Sometimes in my heart I wonder, was it the fact that he actually reduced aluminum? Or was it the fact that his experiment worked? All right? That's a tough question to ask. What time? Okay. I learned at that point that, that if you're an engineer and you like what you're doing, find passion in it, that's what you need. Because in the end, with Dorothy, it wasn't where she got to, it wasn't the man behind the curtain. It wasn't going back to Auntie M. It was about the journey. It was about what the Tin Man taught, what Scarecrow taught, and, and the Calvary line. For Charles Martin Hall, an interesting story. Very, very interesting story. For you, you'll make your own story. For me, I'll tell you a little bit more. The process that I, I started working with was called, is called the direct chill casting process. Um, at the time of Charles Martin Hall, it was book metallurgy. So they would make a closed volume, pour a ladle of aluminum in it, pull the book apart, and roll it or extrude that. That same process was used until 1969 in Alcoa. Up until from the time Charles started until the beginning of World War II, that's the process. Two gentlemen changed the dynamics. William Roth and Bill Enard. Bill, um, sorry, Bill Roth and, Bill and William T. Enard. William worked for Alcoa. Willem worked for the German aluminum company at that time. Okay? 1938, 1940, guess what they were doing? They were getting prepared for the war. Right? Significant things. And so the idea that William had was basically pour the liquid aluminum in a vessel and, and, and use water around it to cool it. Now, that may seem pretty obvious to most of you, but I'm just going to tell you, aluminum, liquid aluminum and water don't mix very well, okay? If you get into the whole thermodynamics, one gram of trinitrotoluene and one gram of aluminum with water has the same energy, available energy, okay? It's exciting. 
<laughs> sometimes think that's why I do this, but I'm not, I don't think so, because I think I just like it. So, Bill and Bill Inor pioneered the process to increase the solidification rates. Both of these guys were mechanics, mechanics or mechanical engineers, who got assimilated into materials. Because it was these two guys, Bill and Bill Inor, that made our airplanes and their airplanes fly longer, carry a bigger payload, land, and kept the propellers on the front of the air, on the front of the motors. There's some really cool stories in, in the annals of aluminum stuff about spies and the way the Germans figured out how Alcoa was solidifying. And it's just it's a lot of fun to read that kind of stuff if you're into that. But I give these two guys credit because what they taught was that you could actually spray water against a very hot surface and solidify because the aluminum is very conductive. At that time, I was, I was, um, I was a tech service engineer at the Wagstaff Company. It was a small family business. Um, I was the oldest, well, I still am, the oldest child. Um, and after my trip to Japan, I started working in my spare time on some research stuff. The aluminum process basically works like this. Um, it's a heat exchanger, and maybe it's round or it's rectangular. You bring a false bottom up into the mold. You start pouring molten aluminum in. You let it sit for 30 seconds, and you start lowering the bottom. The water sprays against the outside. The water's in contact with something that's about 467 degrees Celsius. Um, Spock would be proud of my precision. Um, and the, and the, uh, the heat is removed via conduction. And so the molten aluminum never does, by design, contact the water. And that's the process that we were, we were involved in. And this is an old uh, sales advertisement from, um, from my days at the Wagstaff uh, company. It's a good company. There was a point, though, that I kind of need to move on, right? But um, at the Wagstaff Company, one of the very first things that we realized on the research side was that it's all about heat transfer. Now, I, I don't know if anybody in this room has ever seen a boiling heat flux curve. If you have, could you raise your hand? Please patronize me. OK, we've got a bunch of really stupid mechanical engineers in here that haven't had the S340. Um, boiling heat flux, convection, this is heat, heat, or heat flux on the vertical axis and temperature on the horizontal. This is the film boiling regime, transition, um, critical point, leading frost is down here, and this is where uh, uh, convection going on. Inside of our process, this is, this is the most important thing to keep us safe. We want to make sure that we understand the boiling heat flux curve the very best that we can because up near where the water contacts the surface, we have convection. And right below that, we have nucleate boiling, and then very close, film boiling, and then we reverse back to nucleate and then convection as you go down. All these things are important. This is all that stuff that I had to go back and relearn. My problem sets. I had to go back and reanalyze the Grasshoff the Grasshoff number. I don't know if anybody remembers that. I do, because that's what it's all about. And then we started learning about boiling heat flux in our world. This happens to be our boiling heat flux curve for Egypt. Oops. And at that point, we started learning about what's not in the book. So I mentioned my heat transfer book, which by, was from Frank in Cropera. I went to Purdue, spent a few days with Frank talking to him. I had a pile of questions. It was really helpful for me. And he turned me on to David Vador, who was a, a newly minted PhD student. And David gave me his PhD thesis. He said, 
this is of interest, it may help you. What David didn't realize that day was that we did read it. And that's the foundation of the technology that the Wagstaff Company uses today. It's all taught in David Bader's PhD thesis. Of course, the reason that I tell you this is because three years later, I found David again, and I shared with him what we'd done with his PhD, and with a tear in his eye, he said, thanks for letting me know. He says, I worked a long time, he says, I never thought anybody would ever use it. And it's the foundation of key businesses today, and it's the foundation of keeping a lot of people safe today. But what David taught us, all a little different configuration. What Frank taught in his book, that I learned about the University of Idaho, is correct. But David took it to another level. And that's where the story comes from. Albert Einstein was reported as coming home from giving a, an exam when he was teaching at Princeton. And he had his lab TA with her, his TA with him. And the lab TA looked at the exam and said, Dr. Einstein, isn't that the same test you gave last year? Albert Einstein said, yes it is, it's the same test. And he said, how could you give the same test two years in a row? And he said, because the answers have changed. <laughs> okay. Now what's happening is, you're finishing your education, you've got your books, what you need to realize is that the science evolves and it continues to grow and it continues to help. And you need to stay current because the answers and the boundary conditions and how you see that in life are going to change. Three, keep current in the literature. I did. I got 12,000 papers that I've read over 15 years great experience. I've learned a lot. My journey, unfortunately, started three years after I left the University of Idaho. For time, I'm not going to talk about the process per se, because I want to get to a couple other things. One of the other areas that I learned about that I want to share with you is associated with material science. Now, when I took Metallurgical Engineering 201 uh, from Allen Place, and then 202 from Professor Bobek. They taught me about the equilibrium, lever rule, and the Shiel equation. In those days, that's how we interpreted microstructures. And we spent a whole semester looking at strange materials under a mic, optical mic, and we would characterize them. Well, is this equilibrium? Is this shile? What do the metallics look like? And it got really boring for me, right? And I didn't think I'd ever actually use it until I got to the point where the company that I worked for asked me to make a very special product. Now, aluminum has products that are clad. It means the outside alloy is a little different alloy than the inside. And we had exit, and those are like the airplane skins, radiators for your car. We exited that business because we couldn't compete. And so the company asked me to develop a new process to actually solidify two or three different alloys in the same mold at the same time. So we did. The problem with it, and this is it, let's see if I can. That's how it works. I'll run it twice. Center, then the outside alloy. We do this 360 days a year, all day long in three of our plants. The problem with the process is some of our products in the center require homogenization. Okay, so we, you know, we make this as a non-equilibrium structure, and the center we make it as an equilibrium, we want it as an equilibrium structure to get the right properties. So we have a problem, because, right, child, and lever. We make child, we wanted something in the lever side of the, of the world. 
and we couldn't get there. And I knew that if we took one of these beautiful ingots that we made and put it in the furnace to homogenize it at 610 degrees, we would melt all of the clad off that melts at 577C. Back to the story, back to the books, all right? Until a guy by the name of Takeshi Onaka taught me this. Now, in 1997, he taught that in between Shile and equilibrium, he introduced the new term. He introduced that one. All right? This is the term that he introduced, and, and he's got the uh, ever famous Fourier number. Ooh. Ooh. I didn't want to think about that, but I had to because the interesting part about the Fourier number is the diameter of the crystal radius from the distance in time. He was the first guy that actually said, in between Shile and equilibrium, you can do something in the middle. All right, he taught us that. Now, <coughs> Professor Flemings that wrote my solidification book, he was right. But as Einstein said, the rules, the boundary conditions changed. And that's what Onaka taught us. It was a good thing that I read, and knew how to read Japanese because not a lot of other people could read that article. And this is what we did. <coughs> Same process, we just put a windshield wiper on it. And we literally use windshield wipers. It takes the water off, and it allows the structure to stay hot, extends the time factor, pushes everything back up. And we actually, in a non-equilibrium world, make an equilibrium metallurgical structure, which is kind of cool, all right? Uh, maybe the material science guys are going, yeah, whatever, okay? Right? Now, it's, it's a big deal. And, and I actually had a lot of fun doing it, because it, it made me do, it made me bring everything together. So, Dorothy. Patrick, Bob Wagstaff. It wasn't about going back to Antium. It's about the journey. You're going to take a journey now. And it'll be exciting. You've got some passion. You've got a great education. Don't sell your books back. All right? <coughs> and keep your problem sets. All right? Because you will need them. It's great work. You have a, a, a huge opportunity in your career ahead of you. You have blessings as a University of Idaho student that I didn't have. I, I was totally, I was really excited to see these guys with their little permanent magnets and liquid nitrogen. Okay? Hey guys, we get to play with permanent magnets too. Um, yeah, that big one you got, if it's an N52, it's got a gauss of about 1,200 on it, all right? No. I just bought magnets for a half a million dollars from the CERN project. I got over one Tesla on the surface of it, okay? <laughs> that is really cool, okay? And that's the journey. And my point to you today is you've got the passion, you've got the education, Set your vision, just go forward. Because you will have opportunities that I missed. You'll make a bigger life than I have. And that's the point. Thank you very much for your time today. Before the uh, word ceremony starts, so I'd like to see: Does anyone have a have a question for Dr. Wagstaff? No, you, you were close for that one today. Any questions? I'm okay. 
especially mechanical engineering. I, I asked you guys in these booths some questions that I kind of got in your facial a little bit. <laughs> your chance. <laughs> So inside Novellus, we have furnaces, okay, that melt aluminum scrap, and they're about the size of this room, all right, and they hold about 130 to 150 tons of aluminum, molten aluminum, right, and, and the lid comes off the top, and they, they charge a whole bunch of scrap, obviously, 130 to 150 tons of scrap in it, make a huge pile, put the lid back on it, and just hit it with a lot of natural gas, right? Radiation, and all those radiation equations with, you know, they've got the Arrhenius equation in there somewhere, and the temperature to the fourth, and all that. Fine. Anyway, so we, we, we bought these big magnets. They're about a meter high, they're uh, 14 inches wide, 16 inches deep, and there's four poles in a round circular, uh, cylindrical device and we turn it, we rotate it. So that very same eddy current that you guys are generating, right, as taught by, as you were telling me, the Gauss-Lenz laws, those portions, that abstract portion of Maxwell's equations, okay, this guy's right, okay, we actually rotate it and we circulate molten metal, right, and we can turn 150 tons of molten aluminum, completely circulate it, in three minutes. And I can guarantee you that in that trough, it is laminar. Because Woodney taught me how to do that. Okay? Flow in a V shaped rear. Yeah, it's a good time. Still a little over a Tesla. Okay? You get within two meters of it, my feelings start hurting and I get a headache. You don't want to walk if you're carrying a piece of steel. Uh, in your hands. Now, you don't want to walk within two meters of it, because if you do, you'll smash your hands when it pulls you over to it. Not that that ever happened. But those are the kind of things we get to do. Those are the fun parts of your education. That's the applied part of what you guys get to do. Okay? Anything else? Right. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember, and I really don't want to think about that. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I wasn't a very good student. I, 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 barely, I think I exited here. I think I exited here with a three point um, at the university and a three six in mechanical. It wasn't spectacular. Because remember, I learned everything that I'm practicing now by myself because I didn't understand what I was, I didn't see the value when I was here. That's why I'm here telling you, now's the time. Seize that moment today, I won't do the Latin side of it. Anything else? After we're finished with it in our process? Have, repeat the question. Oh, okay. So the question is, how does the quality of, of recycled aluminum compare to commercially pure? Okay? Right? After I'm done with it, okay, with, okay, aluminum has an affinity to hydrogen. It also has a lot of garbage in it. Okay? So we have first order reactors that remove the hydrogen. They look just like they do in a chemical reaction engineering book, by Bruce Ball or something like that. First order reactors, you know, and Keller thing. And, and then cake or bed filtration, just as we're taught in chemical reaction. Same book. When we're done with it, I pretty well guarantee you, it's going to be better than the smelter. Okay? And I can guarantee you that because I know the last year, 
from our material, we had five cans, five aluminum beverage cans that leaked. Pretty good. Pretty good. Larry? months ago I was up in Spokane and I visited, I visited with Bob and, and spent, actually spent the better part of the day uh, in his office going out into the, uh, to the bay watching uh, the projects he was working on, the processes and feeling the heat from the furnace and so forth. And do you remember when you used to be in school back in high school and so forth, junior high, and you get home from school you got a little bit of time to get out and get to play for a while, run outside and play, or get your Legos out with my kids at school, whatever. Well, that was this guy out there in the, in the high bay. It was amazing to watch him out there on the different projects they were working on, playing with magnets, playing with big stuff. And I could see that kind of excitement in me that my kids used to have when they were playing Legos. It just reminded me of that. And I just, I just want to know, I, I, I want to appreciate what you said today, I, I thought it was a, a good combination of engineering and inspiration, and uh, uh, taught us all, all a lot. And I'm just glad to see your, your enthusiasm all these years later. I appreciate that. But thanks again, Bob, for.